Chapter 9 of Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brengill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brengill. Testify to the Blessing. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. A lieutenant got the blessing of a clean heart in one of my meetings the other day, and then told us that he had had the blessing once before, but lost it, because he failed to testify to it. The devil suggested that it was a great thing to testify to cleansing from all sin, that people would not understand it, they would criticize him, that he would better live it and say nothing about it, and so on, and he heeded these suggestions, kept quiet, and so lost the blessing. That is an old trick of the devil's, by which he has cheated many a soul out of this pearl of greatest price. Paul says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The confession is as necessary as the believing. We insist upon this in the matter of justification, and it is equally important in the matter of sanctification. If we do not testify definitely, humbly, and constantly to the blessed experience, we put our light under a bushel and it goes out. The late Miss Frances E. Willard received the blessing definitely was filled with joy and the sweet peace of heaven, and gave a burning testimony of the fullness of the Spirit. Soon afterwards she became a teacher in a ladies' school, in a section of the country where there was much controversy over the doctrine of holiness. She was advised by her mistaken friends to keep still about sanctification, which she did. Years afterward, she sorrowfully wrote, I kept still until I soon found I had nothing in particular to keep still about. The experience left me. That sweet persuasiveness, that heaven in the soul which I came to know in Mrs. Palmer's meeting, I do not now feel. Mr. Fletcher, whom Mr. Wesley believed to be the holiest man that had lived since the days of the Apostle John, made this confession to his people. My dear brethren and sisters, God is here. I can feel him in this place. But I would hide my face in the dust, because I have been ashamed to declare what he has done for me. For many years I have grieved his spirit, but I am deeply humbled, and he has again restored my soul. Last Wednesday evening he spoke to me by these words, Reckon ye yourselves therefore to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I obeyed the voice of God. I now obey it. I tell you, all to the praise of his love, I am freed from sin, dead unto sin, and alive unto God. I received this blessing four or five times before, but I lost it by not obeying the order of God, who has told us, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
but the enemy offered his bait under various colors to keep me from a public declaration of what god had wrought when i first received the grace satan made me wait a while till i saw more of the fruits i resolved to do so but i soon began to doubt the witness which before i had felt in my heart and i was in a little while sensible that i had lost both a second time after receiving this salvation with shame i confess it i was kept from being a witness for my lord by the suggestion thou art a public character the eyes of all are upon thee and if as before by any means thou lose the blessing it will be a dishonour to the doctrine of heart holiness i held my peace and again forfeited the gift of god another time i was prevailed upon to hide it by reasoning thus how few even of the children of god will receive this testimony many of them suppose that every transgression of the adamic law is sin and therefore if i profess myself to be free from sin all these will give my profession the lie because i am not free in their sense i am not free from ignorance mistakes and infirmities i will therefore enjoy what god hath wrought in me but i will not say i am perfect in love alas i soon found again he that hideth his lord's talent and improveth it not from that unprofitable servant will be taken away even that which he seemeth to have now my brethren you see my folly i have confessed it in your presence now i am resolved before you all to confess my master i will confess him to all the world and i declare unto you in the presence of god the holy trinity i am now dead indeed unto sin and alive unto god through jesus christ who is my indwelling holiness this confession put mr fletcher on record and was the beginning of a life of holiness that has but few parallels for beauty and power it is only at this point of glad definite testimony that the christian life and experience become irresistibly catching like fire when it bursts into flame those who profess this blessing are often accused of boasting but this is not true they are simply declaring that jesus has done for them what he died to do that is to save them from sin they do it in the spirit of a man who healed of a deadly disease declares what the doctor has done for him it is done to bring honor to the doctor and to encourage other poor sufferers to apply to him and to withhold such testimony in the presence of multitudes of needy ones would be a crime david said my soul shall make her boast in the lord the humble shall hear thereof and be glad alleluia as for me i feel i am under a solemn obligation to let every one know that jesus is alive and that he can save to the uttermost and i am determined to testify to this truth not simply as a doctrine but as a glorious experience which is mine just now praise the lord end of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brinkle. Knowing Jesus. What an astonishing thing that we can know Jesus. And yet nothing is more clearly taught in Scripture or more joyously testified to in experience by godly people than this fact. This is an age of specialists when men devote their lives to the pursuit of special departments of knowledge. One learned professor will give fourteen hours a day for forty years to the study of fishes, another to the study of birds, another to that of bugs, and yet another to that of old bones. Another more ambitious devotes his life to the study of history, the rise and fall of nations, and yet another to astronomy, the origin and history of worlds. But to know Jesus Christ is infinitely better than to know all that has been learned or dreamed of by these professors, for he it was that made the worlds, and without him was not anything made that was made. Personally, I am inclined to think that to know Edison would be worth more than knowing one or all of his works, and so to know jesus christ is the first and best of all knowledge amen the knowledge of the naturalist the astronomer the historian may be of passing value but in due time it will be antedated and fail but the knowledge of jesus christ is of infinite value and shall never pass away it is profitable for this world and for that which is to come and only by it does a man come to the knowledge of himself without which it would be better never to have been born. First, in this knowledge of Jesus is hidden the germ of all knowledge, for Paul tells us that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 3. Am I eager for learning and knowledge? Let me then constantly seek to know him, and in due time, in this world or the next, I shall know all that is of value for me to know second in this knowledge lies the true culture of both head and heart especially of the heart in the words of one of the greatest living christian philosophers it enlarges the individual life with universal ideas lifts time into the stream of an eternal purpose and fills it with eternal issues and makes the simplest moral act great as a real factor in the evolution of a higher order and an immortal character it makes a man patient with the ignorant and erring and wayward, courteous to his equals and superiors, kindly and generous to his inferiors, gentle and considerate in his own home, and to the woman who is now his wife as he was to her when she was his sweetheart, loving and forbearing with children, thoughtful and tender with the aged. In fact, the knowledge of Jesus, not simply scraps of knowledge about a Jesus, makes the possessor in his measure like Jesus. Glory to God. The essence of this knowledge is love. John says, Every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. This love is a heavenly thing. The sinner, farthest away from God, loves his own, loves those who love him, and do him good. But this love is that which pours itself out upon strangers, upon enemies, and upon those that despitefully use us and say all manner of evil against us. So we come to see that to know Jesus, we must be like Jesus, must have an affinity for him, must be transformed into his image. In other words, we must be born again and sanctified by his indwelling spirit. Judas lived with Jesus in the intimacy of a disciple for three years. But if he ever knew Jesus, he must have lost that knowledge before he could have gone out to betray him with a kiss. So we may profess the knowledge of Jesus, but when by wicked tempers and unholy conduct and deceitful and sinful character we manifest a spirit contrary to his, we give the lie to our profession. In so far as we are unlike him, to that extent we are ignorant of him. How then shall we come to the knowledge of Jesus? First, we must utterly and forever renounce sin, and seek forgiveness for past bad conduct, trusting in the merits of his atonement for acceptance with God, singing from our hearts, 
oh the blood the blood is all my plea when we do this we shall come into an initial knowledge of our lord jesus christ second but we must not only renounce our sins we must also renounce self in an all night of prayer several years ago i looked at the great audience and queried of the lord in my heart how can all these people get to heaven and in the depths of my soul sounded back the words he bowed his head and gave up the ghost and i saw how men get to heaven and how they gain the knowledge of jesus he gave himself for us and we must give ourselves for him and trust and obey and wait expectantly until he comes to our hearts and reveals himself to our wondering souls for we only know him as he reveals himself to us and this will he do when we seek him with all the heart he surely will paul said what things were gained to me those i counted loss for christ by which he referred to his lineage from abraham his exact fulfilment of the law and his zeal for his church and adds yea doubtless and i count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that i may win christ and be found in him and that i may know him people who seek this knowledge without this sacrifice of self may flatter themselves that they know him but when the testing time comes the hours of loneliness and loss and sickness and pain and disappointment and perplexity and thwarted hopes and desolation they will find their sad mistake the fire will reveal their dross and sin but to those who make and abide in this sacrifice and fighting the good fight of faith steadfastly and joyously believe furnace fires and lion's dens and dungeon cells but disclose more fully the loveliness of his face the certainty of his presence the unfailing strength and comforts of his love third this knowledge to be maintained must be cultivated which is done by communion with him it is possible for a husband and wife to live together for many years and instead of increasing except in the most superficial way in the knowledge of each other to grow apart until after many years they are heart strangers to each other with separate interests conflicting desires and tempers and alien affinities to really know each other they must be bound together by stronger ties than mere legal forms they must commune with each other live in each other's hearts enter into each other's joys and share each other's sorrows counsel each other in perplexity seek the same ends and cultivate the same spirit and so to know jesus there must be sympathy fellowship friendship constantly cultivated the heart must turn to him pour itself out before him share its hopes its joys its fears with him draw its consolations its strength its courage its sufficiency its life from him trust and obey him and delight itself in him as its everlasting portion secret prayer must often bring the soul face to face with him and the bible god's record of him must be daily diligently and lovingly searched and faithfully applied to the daily life thus shall we know him and be changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the spirit of the lord and the people shall see and feel christ in us the hope of glory o jesus saviour how i bless thee that thou didst seek me when lost and far from thee and altogether unlike thee and didst woo me and win me and lead me to thyself and reveal thyself to me and make me to know thee and ravish my heart and humble my pride with the joy and love and glory that that best of all knowledge brings still reveal thyself o lord to thy people that they may know thee and glorify thee and be satisfied with thy loving kindness and fill the earth with thy fame what are some of the chief differences in the experience of the justified and the holy sanctified answer the difference is one of degree rather than of kind all the fruits of the spirit are found in a justified person which are found in a sanctified one but are not brought forth in that perfection which is demanded by the law of god the requirements of god are the same for the justified and the sanctified 
but the sanctified having perfect faith and love and being freed from inbred sin find the yoke easy and the burden light while the justified through internal conflicts often find them irksome a little tract before me states the difference most concisely one in regeneration sin does not reign in sanctification it does not exist two in regeneration sin is suspended in sanctification it is destroyed three in regeneration irregular desires angers pride unbelief are subdued in sanctification they are removed four regeneration is salvation from the voluntary commission of sin sanctification is salvation from the in being of sin five regeneration is the old man bound sanctification is the old man cast out and spoiled of his goods six regeneration is sanctification begun entire sanctification is the work completed in justification people seeing the holiness of god often want more time to get ready to die in sanctification perfect love has cast out all fear end of chapter ten chapter eleven of heart talks and holiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson heart talks on holiness by samuel logan bringle freedom from sin the most startling thing about sin is its power to enslave jesus said he that committeth sin is the servant of sin and everyday life and experience prove the saying to be true let a boy or a man tell a lie and he is henceforth the servant of falsehood unless freed by higher power let the bank clerk misappropriate funds let the business man yield to a trick in trade let the young man surrender to the clamor of lust let the youth take an intoxicating glass and henceforth he is a slave the cord that holds him may be light and silken and he may boast himself free but he deceives himself he is no longer free he is a bondman we may choose the path in life we will take the course of conduct the friends with whom we will associate the habits we will form whether good or bad but having chosen the ways of sin we are then swept on without further choice with a swiftness and certainty down to hell just as a man who chooses to go on board a ship is surely taken to the destined harbor however much he may wish to go elsewhere we choose and then we are chosen we grasp and then we are grasped by a power stronger than ourselves like the man who takes hold of the poles of an electric battery he grasps but cannot let go at his will like the man who took the baby boa constrictor and trained it to coil about him but when grown it crushed him like the lion trainer who put his head in the lion's mouth but one day the lion closed his mouth and crushed his head as he might an eggshell just so the sinner is in the grasp of a higher power than his own he chooses to drink dance gambling worldly pleasure or human wisdom and fame and power but soon finds himself captive only to be surely crushed and ruined for ever unless delivered by some power outside himself what shall he do is there hope is there a deliverer yes thank god there is jesus said whom the son maketh free is free indeed let the sinner cry to jesus and he will break the lion's jaw and paralyze the serpent's mighty coil and turn back the current of the devil's electricity and set the enslaved captives free glory to god some years ago as i was passing out of a church near boston one sunday night a young man an artist stopped me and said brother bringle do you mean to say that jesus can save a man from all sin yes sir i replied that is exactly what i mean to say well if he can said he i want him to save me for i am the victim of a habit that masters me i struggle and vow and make good resolutions but fall again and i want deliverance 
I pointed him to Jesus. We prayed, and the work was done. Glory to God. He remained in and around Boston for six months, shining and shouting for Jesus, and then went to California. Eleven years later, I went to San Francisco. One day, I heard a knock on my door. A young man entered, looked at me, and inquired, Do you know me? I replied, Yes, sir. You are the young man that Jesus saved from a bad habit about twelve years ago near Boston. Yes, he said, and he saves me still. Whom the Son maketh free is free indeed. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. This freedom is altogether complete. Jesus told the disciples to loose a colt that was tied and bring it to him. Mark tells us that he loosed the tongue of a dumb man, and he spake plain. John tells us that when Lazarus came forth from the grave, he was bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Now John uses exactly the same Greek word when he says of Jesus, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy, loose, the works of the devil. In other words, he whom Jesus makes free is loosed from the works of the devil, unhitched from them, as fully as was the colt from the post to which it was tied, or as was Lazarus from his grave clothes. Hallelujah! The sinner is bound to his guilty past, but Jesus forgives and forgets, and he is no longer subject to the penalty of the broken law. The converted man is bound to his inbred sin. Jesus loses him and he is free indeed. It is a complete deliverance, a perfect liberty, a heavenly freedom that Jesus gives by bringing the soul under the law of liberty, which is the law of love. What is meant by saved from self, as it is sung of and testified to in the Salvation Army? Answer. 1. It does not mean the destruction of our will, but the complete union of our will with the will of God, so that we say with Jesus, Not my will, but thine be done. And lo, I come to do thy will, O God. 2. It means that we seek not selfish ends, and that we even lay down our rights and our lives for the glory of God and the salvation of men. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16 he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. John twelve twenty five. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew sixteen twenty four twenty five. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Hendrick, Trinity, Florida. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Wrestlers with God. Rev. William Bramwell writes in one of his letters, Almost every night there has been a shaking among the people, and I have seen nearly twenty set at liberty. Then he adds these heart-searching words, I believe I should have seen many more, but I cannot yet find one pleading man. There are many good people, but I have found no wrestlers with God. Oh, my Lord, that is what we want. In these days of organization, of societies, leagues, committees, multiplied and diversified, soul-searching and ecclesiastical machinery together with worldwide opportunity, above all things else we want, wrestlers with God, men and women who know how to pray and who do pray, not men and women who say prayers, but who pour out their hearts to Him, who call Him to remembrance, and keep not silence and give Him no rest till He establish until he made Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Some weeks ago I went to Corps for the Sunday morning meeting. Just the one meeting. Not many people knew I was coming. No special preparation was made. Snow was on the ground. 
and less than one hundred people were present but a wrestler with god was there and oh how he prayed my heart melts within me yet as i think of it he pleaded with god he poured out his heart before him in his manner and words he was wondrously familiar with god but it was that sweet familiarity that comes from the utter self-abasement and deepest humility and which enables its possessor to come with unabashed faith right face to face with god and ask great things of him because asking only for his honor and the glory of his son that morning twenty-four people were at the penitent form seeking the lord several years ago the writer of this wrote an article on the prayers of soul winners it fell into the hands of two young officers one of whom is now in india and they began to pray and one of them it was reported prayed all saturday night the next day they went to a hard core where it had almost been impossible to get anyone to make a start for heaven and that day they saw sixty-two people seeking god the same article was read by a captain in a certain corps. She became interested and read it to her soldiers, urging them a greater diligence in prayer. The spirit of prayer fell on the soldiers, and some of them used to ask the captain for the key and spend half the night in the hall wrestling with God until his power fell on the people, and scores of sinners were converted, and the largest corps in the state was built up, and the whole city was stirred. The other day, a staff officer in charge of a band of boys told me that a short time before he went with his boys into town after two hours wrestling with God, he got the assurance of a revival. In eighteen days, they saw one hundred and fifty people seeking salvation, and fifty more seeking the blessing of a clean heart. More than all else, the Lord wants those wrestling, pleading men. Indeed, there are many good men, but few wrestlers with God. There are many who are interested in the cause of Christ, and who are pleased to see it prosper in their corps, their church, their city, their country. But there are but few who bear the burden of the world upon their souls day and night, who make his cause in every clime their own, and who, like Eli, would die if the ark of God were taken, who feel it is an awful shame and a consuming sorrow if victory is not continually won in his name this spirit of prayer is fed on the word of god he who neglects diligent daily study of and mediation in the word of god will soon neglect secret prayer while he who feeds upon it will become constantly pouring out his heart in prayer and praise and in this as in all things regular practice will cultivate increase and perfect the spirit of prayer again this spirit of prayer will only thrive where faith is active. Lazy, slow faith quenches prayer. Prayer must be followed by watchfulness and dead and earnest patient work, else it will soon grow sickly and die. Light and foolish talking and jesting, pride, oversensitiveness that leads to suspicion, jealousy, envy, selfish ambition even in Christian work, indulgence of appetite, love of applause of men, and desire for the honor that man could give an uncharitable spirit, criticism, and the like, will surely quench the spirit of prayer. Jesus says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint, while Paul says, Pray without ceasing. How may we know when we are backslidden in heart? Answer 1. When we are filled with our own ways instead of God's ways. For God says, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Therefore shall they be filled with their own devices. 2. When our hearts condemn us. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. 3. When we are unwilling to obey God, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back into Egypt. Of course, a man who is in his heart turns back to the world and the lust of the flesh, even though he does not openly do so, is a backslider in heart. 4. When we willfully and habitually give way to inward sins and unholy desires and tempers, lack of joyful emotions in seasons of great weariness or sickness, or under temptation, so long as the will is true to God, 
is not a sign of a backslidden heart. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. End of chapter 12、Chapter13OfHeartTalksOnHoliness Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brinkle. Union with Jesus. Jesus said, I and my Father are one, and it is His loving purpose that you and I shall be able to say that too, and to say it now, in this present time, in the face of the devil and in holy triumphant defiance of a frowning world and of a shrinking, trembling flesh. There is a union with Jesus as intimate as that of the branch and the vine, or as that of the various members of the body with the head, or as that between Jesus and the Father. This is shown by such scriptures as that in which Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches, and in his great intercessory prayer, where he prays that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they may be one in us. It is also shown in such passages as that in which Paul, speaking of Jesus, says that God hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And again, that we may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. And again, he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. It is also shown clearly in Paul's testimony. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This union is, of course, not physical, but spiritual, and can be known to the one who has entered into it by the direct witness of the Spirit. But it can be known to others only by its effects and fruits in the life. This spiritual union is mysterious and yet simple. And many of our everyday relationships partially illustrate it. Where two people have interests or purposes the same, they are to that extent one. A liberal, conservative, or unionist is one with every other man of his party throughout the whole country in so far as they hold similar principles. This is an imperfect sort of union, and yet it is union. Our general may be in any part of the world, pushing forward his mighty schemes of conquest for Jesus, and every other salvationist, however humble he may be, just in so far as he has the same spirit and ideals as the general, is one with him. A husband and wife, or a boy and his mother, may be separated by continents and seas, and yet be one. For six months, three thousand miles of wild waves rolled between me and a little woman I rejoiced to call wife. But my heart was absolutely true to her, and my confidence in her fidelity was as supreme as now when we sit side by side, and we were one. But more perfect, more tender, more holy, and infinitely more self consuming, and ennobling, and enduring is the union of the soul with Jesus than is any other possible relationship. It is the union of the bay with the sea, it is the union of nature. A co mingling of spirit, an eternal marriage of heart and soul and mind. One, it is a union of will. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And again, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And so it is with those who are one with Jesus. The psalmist said, I delight to do thy will, O God. And that is the testimony of every one who has entered into this divine union. There may and doubtless will be times when this will is hard for flesh and blood, but even then the soul says with its Lord, Not my will but thine be done, and prays always, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the very nature of things, there can be no union with Jesus without this union of will. For there is really very little of a man but his will. That is really all he can call his own. His mind, with all its splendid powers and possibilities, may be reduced to idiocy. He may be robbed of his property, his health, 
and even his life may be taken away from him but who can enter into the domain of his will and rob him of that i say it reverently so far as we know not even god can compel a man's will god wants to enter into a partnership an infinitely tender and exalting fellowship a spiritual marriage with the will of man and he approaches man with tremendous inducements and motives of infinite profit and loss and yet the man may resist and utterly thwart the loving thought and purpose of god he can refuse to surrender his will but surrender he must if there is to be a union between him and god for god's will based as it is on eternal righteousness founded in infinite knowledge and wisdom and love is unchangeable and man's highest good is in a hearty and affectionate surrender to it and a union with it two it is a union of faith of mutual confidence and esteem god trusts him and he trusts god god can entrust him with the honor of his name and his holy character in the midst of a world of rebels god can empower him and beautify him with his spirit and adorn him with all heavenly graces without any fear that the man will take the glory of these things to himself god can heap upon him riches and treasures and honors without any fear that the man will use them for selfish ends or prostitute them to unholy purposes again the man trusts god he trusts god when he cannot trace him he has confidence in the faithfulness and love of god in adversity as well as in prosperity he does not have to be fed on sweet meats and live in sunshine and sleep on roses in order to believe that god is for him god can mingle bitter with all his sweets and allow the thorns to prick him and the storm clouds to roll all about him and yet he will stubbornly trust on like job his property may be swept away in a day and his children die about him and yet with job he will say the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed to be the name of the lord and still trust on his own life may be menaced and be filled with weariness and pain and his faithless wife bid him curse god and die and yet he will say what shall we receive good at the hands of the lord and shall we not receive evil and still trust on his friends may gather about him and attack his christian integrity and character and foolishly assault the foundations of his faith by assuring him that if he were right with god these calamities could never befall him and yet he will look up from his ash heap and out of his utter wreck and ruin and desolation and cry though he slay me yet will i trust him and though communities or nations conspire against him he will say with david the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the strength of my life of whom shall i be afraid though an host should encamp against me my heart shall not fear though war should rise against me in this will i be confident a woman said to me the other day i dread to think of the end of the world it makes me afraid but though worlds like drunken men tumble from their orbits and though the universe crash into ruin the childlike confidence of the man who trusts god will enable him to sing with the psalmist god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea though the waters thereof roar and be troubled though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof god can be familiar with such a man he can take all sorts of liberties with his property his reputation his position his friends his health his life and allow devils and men to taunt him but the man unchangeably fixed in his estimate of god's holy character and everlasting love will certainly triumphantly trust on three it is a union of suffering of sympathy once when i was passing through what seemed to me a perfect hell of spiritual temptation and sufferings the lord supported me with this text in all their affliction he was afflicted isaiah sixty nine the prophet refers in these words to the afflictions of the children of israel in egypt and in the wilderness after their escape from the hard bondage of pharaoh and he says in all their sufferings jesus suffered with them 
let her child be racked with pain and scorched with fever and choked with croup but the mother suffers more than the child and so let the people of god be sore tempted and tried and jesus agonizes with them he is the world's great sufferer his passion is for ever he once tasted death for every man he suffers still with every man there is not a cry of anguish nor a heartache nor a pang of spiritual pain in all the world that does not reach his ear and touch his heart and stir all his mighty sympathies but especially does he suffer and sympathize with his own believing children and in turn the man who is one with jesus suffers and sympathizes with jesus any injury to the cause of christ causes him more pain and injury than any of his own personal interests can do he mourns over the desolations of zion more than over the loss of his property the lukewarmness of christians cuts him to the heart the cry of the heathen for the gospel of salvation is to him the cry of the travail the agony of jesus himself he gladly says with david the reproaches of him that reproach thee have fallen upon me he esteems the reproach of christ greater treasure than all the pleasures and power and profits of this world combined as the true wife gladly suffers privation and shame and reproach with her husband whom she knows to be righteous and honourable so he who is one with jesus rejoices that he is counted worthy to suffer shame for his name he suffers and sympathizes with jesus four it is a union of purpose the great mass of men serve god for reward they do not want to go to hell they want to go to heaven and that is right but it is not the highest motive there is a union with jesus in which the soul is not so anxious to escape hell as it is to be free from sin and in which heaven is not so desirable as holiness the soul in this state thinks very little about its reward his smile of approval is its heaven the housekeeper wants wages but the wife never thinks of such a thing she serves for very love she is one in purpose with her husband his triumphs are hers his losses are hers all he has is hers and she is his and as the apostle says all things are yours and ye are christ's the will of god is the supreme good of this man someone has said that if two angels were sent into this world one of whom was to rule it and the other was to sweep street crossings that the sweeper would be so satisfied with his heavenly father's will that he would not exchange places with the ruler the purpose of god is to save the world and uphold the honor of god and establish truth in the lives the hearts the laws the customs of men and this is the purpose of this man in order to do this jesus sacrificed every earthly prospect and laid down his life and this man does the same he does not stand in the presence of the world's great crying need and hesitate and wonder if the lord really wants him to give a few cents or dollars for the salvation of the heathen he does not quibble as to whether god really requires him to make the sacrifice and leave his dog kennel and chicken coop and barn and house furnished a little below the standard of beauty and luxury set by his ungodly neighbors he doesn't struggle and kick against the pricks when he feels god would have him forsake business and preach the gospel he would loathe himself to have such mean thoughts he doesn't say if i were rich but out of the abundance of his poverty he pours into the lap of the world's need and like the widow he gladly gives all his living to save the world and when god looks about for a man to stand up for his honor and warn a wicked world and offer terms of peace to sinners this man doesn't say if i were only educated or gifted i would go but with a heart flaming with love for jesus and the world he has bought with his blood cries out here am i send me it can be said of him as it was of the lord the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up a young carpenter in new england whose name is unknown every few months comes to the divisional headquarters and gives a hundred or more dollars for the work of god in india or some other portion of the world he is one with jesus in his purpose to save the world on a bitter wintry day a poor woman came to john wesley's apartment in oxford university she was shivering with cold 
wesley asked her why she did not dress more warmly she replied that she had no warmer garments when she was gone wesley looked at the pictures on his walls and said to himself in substance if my lord should come would he be pleased to see these on my walls when his poor are suffering with cold then he sold the pictures and gave to the poor and in this way began the mighty and lifelong beneficence and almost matchless self-sacrifice that has led to the blessing of millions upon millions of men o oh my god that thy people might see what union with thee really means do you ask how can i enter into this union one read god's promises until you see that it is possible especially read and ponder over the fifteenth and seventeenth chapters of st john two read and ponder over the commandments until you see that it is necessary without this union here there will be no union in eternity three make the sacrifice that is necessary in order to become one with jesus the woman who will be the true wife of a man must be prepared to give up all other lovers leave her home and forsake father mother brothers and sisters change her name and utterly identify herself her prospects for life her all with the man she loves and so must you be prepared to identify yourself utterly with christ to be hated despised rejected crucified of men but armed baptized with the holy ghost and crowned of god does your heart consent to this my brother if so make a perpetual covenant with your lord just now do it intelligently do it with a true heart in full assurance of faith and god will seal you for his own do not waver do not doubt do not cast away your confidence because of your feelings or lack of feelings but stand by your facts walk by faith and god will soon prove his ownership in you in a way that will be altogether satisfactory to both your head and your heart and convincing to men and devils what is the difference between justification and sanctification answer in justification a man is freely forgiven for all his sins is partially renewed in the divine image is adopted into god's family and enters into peace being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ romans five one ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of god romans eight fifteen sixteen. in justification however there are remains of the carnal mind it is a mixed state in which evil tempers dispositions and desires war against the divine nature in the soul paul describes it when he says the flesh battles against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that we may not do the things that we would galatians five seventeen r v many people also consider the last part of romans seven as a description of the struggle of a justified soul against its inbred sin in sanctification a man is delivered from the remains of the carnal mind from doubts and fears evil tempers and desires shame of the cross and the like and is made perfect in submission in faith in love but now being made free from sin and become servants to god ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life romans six twenty two but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance and they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts galatians five twenty two to twenty four ye are dead and your life is hid with christ in god colossians three three end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of heart talks on holiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by devora allen heart talks on holiness by samuel logan bringle chapter fourteen in god's school 
man is the supreme product in this world and the struggle with adversity and evil forces is a part of god's plan of developing him for mansions and thrones and crowns and kingdoms in the world to come therefore we must believe and hope and love and struggle on in due time we shall reap if we faint not we must beware of discouragement and from running away from the conflict if we flee we shall perish forever if we fight to the finish we shall conquer though we die nothing can come to us that god does not permit and which by his grace cannot be made to work out our higher good god wants to build us up in holy character but holy character is for eternity and is many-sided and therefore must be subjected to manifold testings we must be taught by both pain and pleasure we must learn how to abound and to suffer need and in this we shall be plunged often from the heights to the depths and hurled from the depths to the heights again today the sun shines and the world is full of beauty and life seems a holiday but tomorrow the storm clouds lower and the beauty is hid and we are prone to fear that the sun will shine no more today men look upon us and smile and shout hosanna but tomorrow they frown and gnash their teeth and cry out crucify him today we have plenty and can feed the multitudes of the hungry with what we have to spare tomorrow we ourselves are hungry and know not where to turn for bread today our pulse is full and we feel strong to chase a thousand tomorrow we are feeble and broken and life is a burden today we pray and god hears us before we call and answers while we are yet speaking tomorrow we plead and weep and moan and the heavens seem shut and the mocking tempter whispers where is thy god now today job is the richest man in all the east and his sons are the strongest and his daughters are the fairest in the land tomorrow he is a pauper and childless today joseph is the pet of his father's heart and home tomorrow he is under the lash and is toiling and galled with the slave gang's chain today david weds the king's daughter tomorrow the king with murderous hate hurls his javelin at him and chases him over and around the mountains as he would a partridge or a wolf today daniel sits next to the king in the midst of the hundred and twenty princes and counsellors tonight he is in the lion's den what means all this uncertainty and mystery of pleasure and pain of hope and despair of favor and disfavor ah hallelujah it means that god wants us for himself whom the lord loveth he disciplineth it means that he sees there is something in us worth his while to educate and he is educating us a friend of mine owned a gold mine he promised the lord every penny of profit from it he made nothing but lost twenty thousand pounds in that mine he went to the lord about it the lord said i am educating you and i can afford to spend millions to do so my friend cried out o oh lord if thou canst afford it i can for thou knowest i want to be educated in thy school god would make us strong in faith mighty in prayer unfailing in hope content whatever our lot perfect in love fearless in our devotion to truth lovers of men and more than conquerors he would wean us from man in whom there is no help to himself he would detach us from the world and fasten us by every tie to heaven when job shall have learned his lesson which is not for himself alone but for ten thousand times ten thousand other perplexed sufferers as well he shall have his riches doubled and restored to him again with strongest sons and fairest daughters joseph shall leave the prison cell and slave gang's chain and sit as favorite in pharaoh's palace and rule his empire the king shall die by his own hand and david shall sit upon his throne daniel shall escape from the lion's den and rise to higher honor and esteem than he knew before thus shall it be with the man who does not kick against the pricks but nestles low under god's hand and rejoices and obeys and trusts and doubts not while god educates flowers need night's cool darkness the moonlight and the dew so christ from one who loved it his shining oft withdrew and then for cause of absence my troubled soul i scanned but glory shadeless shineth in emmanuel's land 
The secret of peace and victory under all these circumstances is a little more faith in Jesus. In God's school we learn through the heart rather than through the head, and by faith rather than logic. Lord, I believe. Amen. End of chapter 14、Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Holiness and Self Denial. One day Mr. Wesley was to dine with a rich man. One of his preachers, who was present, said, Oh, sir, what a sumptuous dinner! Things are very different to what they were formerly. There is but little self denial now among the Methodists. Mr. Wesley pointed to the table and quietly remarked, My brother, there is a fine opportunity for self denial. Denial that is not self imposed is not self denial. It might have been a self denial on the part of the host to present a less sumptuous table, but there would then have been no self denial on the part of the guest. Adverse circumstances or selfish people may deprive us of the luxuries and even the necessities of life, but our deprivation would not be self denial. We would deny ourselves only when we voluntarily give up that which we like. And which we might lawfully keep. And I have no doubt that God often allows us luxuries and abundance, not that we may consume them upon ourselves, but rather that we may deny ourselves joyfully for His dear sake and the sake of the needy ones about us. Often, when urging upon well to do people the importance of denying themselves in dress and furniture and equipage and the luxuries of life, I have had them turn to me and say, If God did not mean me to have these things and enjoy them, why did He give me the means to get them? And poor things, they thought they had crushed me with their logic. But the answer is simple. God meant them to be stewards, but they considered themselves owners. God meant them to have the greater blessedness of giving, for it is more blessed to give than to receive. But they contented themselves with what they considered the blessedness of receiving. God meant them to pass on his bounty to the multitudes of needy ones about them, but they dammed up and diverted the streams of God's mercy and reveled in what they considered God's special favor and license to unlimited self indulgence, while the multitudes for whom God really intended these blessings perished of want. They show unmistakably by their conduct that they have not the Spirit of Jesus, who, though he was rich, for our sakes became poor. That we through his poverty might be rich. And on the judgment day they will surely be found wanting, and woeful will be their condemnation. Why does God give a woman wealth? That she may spend it on feathers and flowers and silks and satins and luxurious apartments? Nay, but that she may spend it better upon those who are hungry and cold and dying of bitter want. Why does God give a mother brilliant, manly sons and lovely daughters, that she may enjoy their presence and train them for society and a career before the world? Nay, but that she may train them to be martyrs, slum angels, missionaries to the heathen and to the barefooted, debauched, neglected, devil ridden children of the saloons and brothels. Oh, as I have looked at my sweet baby boy and girl and realized the almost infinite difference between their training. And that of millions of little ones who have the same rights in Jesus Christ that my children have, as I have realized the tender care with which they are unceasingly watched and sheltered and trained for God and righteousness. My heart has poured itself out to God in unutterable longings, not that they might be great, but that they might be good, not that they might fill the earth with their fame, but that they might utterly sacrifice themselves for those who have never known. The love and instruction of a sainted mother and a Christian home. Why does God give a man power and influence and fame? That he may be great in the eyes of men and lord it over his fellows and clothe himself in purple and fine linen and live luxuriously? Nay, but that he may throw every jot and tittle of his power and influence 
into the scale of righteousness of conduct and holiness of character and hasten the utter establishment of the kingdom of god upon earth self-denial almost ceases to be self-denial when practiced from such a high and holy motive it is the denial of the lower base earthly self and the gratification of the higher and heavenly self it is a turning from earth to heaven from that which is fleeting and temporal to that which is eternal it enlightens the mind it nobles the character perfects the heart and brings us into fellowship with jesus bless god hallelujah if any man will come after me let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me two i once read an illustration of mr finney's that has had a marked influence on my life in substance it was this suppose a man were traveling in a foreign land and being waylaid and captured by brigands he were sold into slavery and a great ransom demanded for his release at last word reaches his anxious wife informing her of his sad state and the only condition upon which he could possibly be restored to her his bondage is cruel and is fast wearing his life away but there is no way of escape except the ransom be paid all the love and affection and pity and sympathy of the wife's heart are roused to the uttermost she fears for her loved one's life she can feel the galling chain she can see the cruel lash of the slave driver she can realize the heart loneliness and bitter bondage of her darling and she wishes she could fly to his side and share his burden and his sorrow and no sacrifice seems too great to gain his liberty she sells all her property she lays her case before her friends and neighbors and they assist her and yet she falls far below the amount of the ransom demanded she labors and toils early and late and hastens to earn what money she can to add to what she already has she denies herself every luxury and almost begrudges every necessity of life she thinks of the hard fare of her husband the coarse scanty food the miserable hovel the hard filthy bed the heavy unremitting labor and the thought of selfish gratification is painful to her at last a stranger hears her sad story visits her and gives her twenty pounds she does not for an instant think now i shall be able to get me a new dress and bonnet in the latest fashion or get a nice piece of furniture for my rooms or furnish my table better than in the past no no she bursts into tears she thanks the giver and then cries now i shall be able to ransom my love and soon i shall have him in my arms again now when the christian whose heart throbs with love for the saviour realizes that jesus puts himself in the place of the prisoner in this lonely dark cell the slave toiling without recompense under the lash with the galling clanking chain the sick one on the bed of sleeplessness and pain the heathen in his blindness and ignorance and superstition and fear the helpless orphan and the poor widow and the outcast sinner and says inasmuch as ye did it unto one of the least of these ye did it unto me he must deny himself when he sees jesus lonely and full of toil and sorrow again in the person of those suffering ones he finds it easier to deny himself than to indulge himself and self-sacrifice becomes a joy while self-indulgence becomes a grief and a moral impossibility it is for this reason that i deny myself it is for jesus and the souls for whom he died for years i lived for myself all my hopes and ambitions centered on myself and even my desire to go to heaven was more a desire to escape from the pains of hell than to enjoy the society of jesus and redeemed souls and to do good and to be holy but at last all this was changed my sins became a burden i loathed myself the righteous indignation and wrath of god against evildoers took hold upon me and i feared i should be lost for ever but i found deliverance through jesus through him i found forgiveness of sins and freedom from the bondage of selfishness he did not upbraid me but loved me freely and won my heart and filled me with a confidence and love toward him that were unutterable with that love to him came a love for the whole world of saints and sinners at first i groped about somewhat blindly to know how to express that love but true love will always finally express itself in uttermost self-sacrifice for its object and in so doing adds fuel to its flame 
Since then I have found it easier to give than to withhold. I began by giving one-tenth of my income, but I couldn't stop there. Any case of need, any appeal for help, wrung my heart with an anguish of desire to give, until if it were not for the foresight of a prudent wife who gets me to lay up money with her for a needed suit, I should frequently be without suitable clothes to wear. This is not natural. It is spiritual, supernatural. In the old days, when I had plenty of money, I can remember that it was rather grudgingly that I subscribed two dollars a year to the support of the gospel. I should be decidedly ashamed to tell this, but for the fact that I am now a new creature, and an honest confession is good for the soul. How can I indulge myself while others suffer? How can I hoard up wealth in this world's goods while others perish of want? Why can't I not trust him to supply my wants who feeds the sparrow with unfailing supply? Why did he speak so if it were not to encourage one to cast abroad with an open liberal hand and trust him for daily bread? I want the full strength of trust to prove, and how can I have such trust if I never once in my life give away all I have and boldly trust him to supply my need and confound a taunting devil? I have done it, glory to God and he has not failed me. Instead of finding my feet on quicksands, I found them on granite, and instead of starvation, I found plenty. Bless God forever. Oh, there is a divine philosophy in self-denial that the wise folks of this world never dream of. Are the experiences of justification and sanctification distinct? And if so, how long a time must intervene between them? Answer. 1 they are distinct. The Thessalonians were justified, for the apostle tells us that they had received the Lord Jesus Christ, and had such faith that it was sounded abroad throughout the whole world, and they endured bitter persecutions rather than deny their faith. But yet they were not wholly sanctified. So after some very definite instructions, the apostle said, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 The experience of the disciples before Pentecost was that of justified persons. They received this justification when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, forsook all and followed him. But they were not sanctified wholly until on the day of Pentecost they sought and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 2. Only so long a time need elapse between the two experiences as it's necessary for the justified soul to get light on the remains of the carnal mind in his heart, and the way by which, through faith in Jesus, he may get rid of it. Many people have been justified and sanctified within a few hours. There is a boy in one of our New England corps who received the two experiences within a few hours of each other, and gives the clearest and most definite testimony to both works. However, in most cases, months or even years intervene, through lack of definite teaching, through unwillingness to obey God, and through weak faith or positive unbelief. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Heart Talks on Holiness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle Spiritual Power God is the source of all spiritual power, and should be sought for constantly in two ways, by meditation in His Word and by secret prayer, if we would have and retain power. Several years ago I was specialing at a New England corps, commanded by a rather gifted ensign. He appeared to be much impressed by my familiarity with and use of the Bible, and one day remarked that he would be willing to give a fortune, if he had it, for an equal knowledge of the Scriptures. He was much taken aback when I assured him that he was quite mistaken as to the strength of his desire. For if he really wanted to get acquainted with his Bible, he could easily do so by spending the hour and more that he gave to his newspapers each day. 
in prayerful study of God's Word. Men are everywhere crying and sighing for power and the fullness of the Spirit, but neglecting the means by which this power and fullness are secured. The saintly Fletcher said, quote, an eager attention to the doctrines of the Holy Spirit made me in some degree overlook the medium by which that Spirit worked. I mean the word of truth, by which the heavenly fire warms us. I rather expected lightning than a steady fire by means of fuel. Unquote. Glad, believing, secret prayer, and patient, constant meditation in the word of God will keep the sanctified man full of power full of love and faith, full of God. But neglect of these results in spiritual weakness and dryness, joyless labor and fruitless toil, and, unless a remedy is found, spiritual death will surely, if not swiftly, follow. If any reader of this has lost the power and juice and sweetness of his experience through neglect of these simple means, he will not receive the blessing back again by working himself up into a frenzy of agony in prayer, but rather by quieting himself and talking plainly to God about it, and then hearkening diligently to what God says in his word and by his spirit. Then peace and power will soon return and need never be lost any more. Alleluia! Most people give their bodies about ten hours a day in eating and drinking and dressing, and sleeping, and maybe a few minutes to their souls. We ought to give at least one solid hour every day to restful, loving devotion with Jesus over our open Bible, for the refreshing, developing, and strengthening of our spiritual life. If we would do this, God would have an opportunity to teach, correct, inspire, and comfort us, reveal His secrets to us, and make spiritual giants of us. If we will not do this, we shall surely be spiritual weaklings all our days, however we may wish to be strong. The devil will rob us of this hour if we do not steadfastly fight for it. He will say, go and work, before we have gotten the spiritual food that strengthens us for work. The devil's piety and eager interest in God's work is amazing when he sees a soul upon his knees. It is then that he transforms himself into an angel of light, and woe be to the soul that is deceived by him at this point. I do thank God that, for many years, as a field officer, a divisional officer, and a spiritual special, he has helped me to resist the devil at this point, and to take time with him until my soul has been filled with his glory and strength and made triumphant over all the power of the enemy. Glory to God! Quote, and now, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Unquote. Acts 20, 32 End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Heart Talks of Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter Seventeen. Jesus, the Working Man. Peter the Great, Tsar of all Russia and in some respects the mightiest monarch of his day, used to make shoes like a common cobbler that he might enter into sympathy with his people and help them to realize that labor is not menial, but honorable and full of dignity. It was a great stoop from the throne of Russia to a cobbler's bench, but I will tell you of a greater. The apostle tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 that God made the worlds by his Son and that the Son upholds all things by the word of his power. John tells us in the first chapter of his Gospel that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
He is the master workman whom the heaven of heavens cannot contain. Inhabiting eternity, Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Stretching forth the heavens as a curtain, making mighty systems of sun, moon, and stars, creating worlds and hurling them into the awful abysses of space and causing them to move, not in chaotic confusion, but in more than clock-like harmony by the silent, resistless energy of all-embracing laws. He scoops out the bed of mighty oceans. He tosses aloft hoary mountains and stretches forth vast prairies and sandy deserts. He peoples the worlds with living creatures, until the imagination is almost paralyzed by the contemplation of the wonders of his handiwork. He is the maker of the infinitely great and infinitely small. He made the fixed star billions of miles away and millions of times bigger than the earth on which we live, and he made the tiny insect so small that it can be seen only by the aid of the microscope, and he fitted that little mite with its perfect organs of digestion, respiration, and reproduction. He garnished the heavens and stretches forth the rainbow, and he painted the insect's wings and polished the lens of its little eye. Oh, he is a wondrous workman. But John tells us, The Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Apostle tells that, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like his brethren. And when he clothed himself with our flesh, when he hid his dignity under the humble garb of our humanity, he did not come as an aristocrat, but he took a lowly place in a peasant's home. He alone of all the children of men chose his mother, and he chose one who was poor and humble and unknown amongst men. In his mighty descent from the bosom of the Father to the womb of the Virgin, he might have stopped at the throne of some mighty earthly empire, or among the rich and lordly. But instead of that he went down past the thrones and palaces, and was born in a stable in a manger among the cattle, that he might not be other than the lowliest of his brethren. He came to a life of obscurity, of poverty, and of toil, and he who made the world and upheld them by the word of his power learned to be a carpenter. The artists, when they paint a picture of Jesus, paint a face of almost womanly softness, and would picture him to us as a delicate man, with hair parted in the middle, and with patrician hands and tapering fingers. But the Bible rather pictures him to us as a horny-handed man of toil, whose back was bent to labor, and who earned his bread by the sweat of his brow. Bless him! Indeed, he was made like unto his brethren. He became brother to the humblest son of toil, and since he became a working man, he has put a dignity on labor that exceeds the dignity of kings and queens. Jesus was a working man, and as such understands working men. He knows their weaknesses. He has been pinched with their poverty. He can sympathize with them in their long hours of toil that bars them from that culture of mind which, no doubt, many crave. He understands. But while he suffered and toiled and was tempted and tried as his brethren, and was debarred from the luxurious of wealth and the culture of schools, yet he was not debarred from culture of the heart and fellowship with his father. He could be pure, he could be holy, he could be loving and patient and kind and true, and he did this dying for us to escape from our sins and become men after the pattern of himself. We may not be great, but we may be good. We may not be able to erect a Brooklyn Bridge or build a St. Peter's at Rome, but we can do our little task well and in the spirit of Jesus. We can be kind and patient and faithful and true. We can become partakers of his spirit and do our work as unto him, and by and by we shall enter into his glory. And we shall not be rewarded for the greatness of the work we have done, but rather for the faithfulness of the work we have done. And by and by we shall enter into his glory. And we shall not be rewarded for the greatness of the work we have done, but rather for the faithfulness with which we have done it. The carpenter who has built houses, the blacksmith who has shod horses, the man who has carried a hod, the boy who has blacked boots, the clerk who has toiled over the ledger, the farmer who has ploughed the fields and fed cattle. If he has done it faithfully, with his heart washed in the blood and full of love for the master and his fellow men, in the spirit of prayer and thanksgiving, 
shall have as abundant an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of Jesus the carpenter, and shall have a place as near the throne as the man who preached the gospel to thousands of governed states and ruled kingdoms. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brangle. Chapter eighteen The Legacy of Holiness. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac. Genesis chapter 25 verse 11 We must die. We feel that we must live, must live for the sake of our sons, for the people of God whom we love as our own souls, and for the perishing sinners about us. We are prone to magnify our own importance, to think no one's faith is so mighty, no one's industry is quite so fruitful, no one's love quite so unfailing no one's presence quite so necessary as ours. But after we die, the blessed God will still live. His years fail not, and he will bless our sons and carry on his work. Glory to God. Have faith in God, brother. Trust the Lord, sister. He will bless your children after you are dead. Be sure you have given your children to God, given them not in order that they may be saved from hell, but that they may be saved from sin, from enmity to God, from pride and worldliness and selfishness and unbelief, saved that they may be saviors of others, and God will bless them when you are dead. Do not choose ease and wealth and worldly power and fame for your children, but rather choose the lowly way of the cross. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and rejected of men. Ask the Lord with all your heart to make your children like their master and to lead them in the paths he trod. And when you are dead, God will remember your prayers and bless them. Some years ago, I was talking with a young lady whom God marvelously blessed and used in his work. Each of us had lost both of our parents when we were quite young. They were godly parents who had given us to the Lord. And then, when it seemed we most needed their counsel and discipline, they died. But God took us up and blessed us. As we talked about the past, we could see the hand of God, through corrections and faithful fatherly chastenings, shaping our whole lives, and bringing blessings out of what seemed the greatest calamities, until we were lost in wonder at his wisdom and goodness, and our mouths were filled with praise. If our parents could have foreseen how God would tenderly care for us and bless us, how it would have softened their dying pillows. Ah, there is the secret cause of our trouble that we cannot foresee. The more reason, then, why we should trust. We walk by faith, not by sight. Therefore we should trust. God is love. Therefore we should trust. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. God may have blessed Isaac before the death of Abraham, but I am glad we are told that he blessed him after the death of Abraham. God has a memory. He doesn't forget. God is faithful. He breaks no promises. God is good. He delights to show mercy and bestow blessings. Be faithful yourself. God said of Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Do your part well as you know how. Search the Bible to know what God will have you do, and do it. Pray for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and it shall be given him. God will not upbraid you for your ignorance, if you want to be wise. Therefore pray for wisdom. Pray for patience. If you plant corn, it does not spring up the next morning. 
It lies in the ground for many days and dies. But God's eye is upon it, and he will bless it and cause it to bring forth fruit. And so will it be with your seed sowing in the hearts of your children. But you must have patience. Pray for patience. If you are patient and have faith in God and are not walking by sight, you will continue to pray in hope and to sow the seed which is the word of God, though it seems to be utterly useless. It is not useless. Glory to God. Though you may die, yet after you are dead, God will bless your Isaacs. He surely will. If a sanctified person loses the blessing, has he also lost his justification? And does he have to be forgiven and justified before he can claim sanctification? Answer, a man who has lost the blessing can, by hearty repentance, confession and faith, get back at one step to the place from which he fell. And in some cases, persons whose hearts have been broken with contrition have so trusted Jesus as to enter into a deeper, richer experience than they had before they fell. They need not trouble themselves about these fine distinctions, but turn to the Lord with a true heart. Trust him, and he will receive them. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 this does not give us license to sin, but gives us hope that if we in an evil hour do sin, we can get back again. In the first six verses of the thirtieth chapter of Deuteronomy, God promises that if the people who have left him shall repent of their sins and turn to him with all their hearts, that he will receive them and will restore them all that they have lost, and adds, The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Heart Talks on Holiness。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter 19. Thanksgiving. Quote, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. David. Quote, In everything give thanks. Paul. As lilies of the valley pour forth perfume, so good hearts pour forth thanksgiving. No mercy is too small to provoke it, no trial too severe to restrain it. As Samson got honey from the carcass of the lion he slew, and as Moses got water from the flinty rock, so the pure in heart are possessed of a sort of heavenly alchemy, a divine secret by which they get blessing out of all things, and for which there is giving of thanks. A jubilant old saint in Boston came down to hoary hairs in deepest poverty, and had to live on the charity of such friends as God raised up, and he raised them up. Bless his name. He who fed Elijah in the wilderness by the brook, and in the poverty-stricken home of the desolate widow, found a way to feed his child in Boston. God is not blind, nor deaf, nor indifferent, nor indigent. He is not the silent God that some people in their self-conceit and wayward unbelief suppose. He knows how to be silent and how to hide himself from the proud in heart. But he cannot hide himself anywhere in his big universe from childlike faith and pure, obedient, long-suffering, patient love. Hallelujah! This old saint believed, obeyed, and rejoiced in God, and he raised up friends to supply her needs. Now, one day, one of them went upstairs with a dinner for the old lady, and as she came to the door, she heard a voice within, 
and thinking there was a visitor present and delicately wishing that her charity should not be a cause for embarrassment she stopped and listened it was the voice of the old christian at her table and she was saying o oh, father i do thank thee with all my heart for jesus and for this crust to her thankful heart that crust was more than a feast and a well-filled cupboard and a fat bank account to him who has not a trustful thankful spirit i heard of a rich man the other day who killed himself because he feared he might become poor he was poor jesus said a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth and no more does a man's real riches but rather in the spirit with which he possesses them heaven is not parcelled off into lots and estates the angels own nothing and yet they possess all things and are eternally rich and so with the true saint that trusts god and loves and obeys and is thankful the stars in their courses fight for him he is now in harmony with the elemental and heavenly forces and eternal laws of the universe of god and all things work together for his good not a hair of his head falls without god's notice not a desire rises in his heart but god's great heart throbs responsive to fulfil it for does not the psalmist say he will fulfil the desires of them that fear him not simply the fervent prayer but the timid secret desire that has not been voiced in prayer shall be fulfilled and how dare god do that because holy fear will not allow a desire that is not in harmony with god's character and the interests of his kingdom napoleon gave blank cheques on his bank to one of his marshals one complained to the emperor that the drafts made were enormous and should not be allowed let him alone he trusts and honours me and i will trust him said napoleon god puts all things at the command of his saints and trusts them while he asks them to trust him why then should we not be thankful nothing will keep a heart so young and banish carking care so quickly and smooth the wrinkles from the brow so certainly and fill the life with such beauty and make one's influence so fragrant and gracious and shed abroad such peace and gladness as this sweet spirit of thankfulness this spirit can and should be cultivated there is much in the lot of each of us to be thankful for we should thank him for personal liberty and for the measure of health we have there is a good old soul up the hudson who for thirty years or thereabouts has been lying in bed while her bones have softened and she is utterly helpless and always in pain but she praises and praises and praises god we should thank him that we are not insane that our poor minds are not unbalanced and rent and torn by horrid nightmares and dread and nameless terrors and deep despair and wild and restless ravings we should thank him for the light and blessings of civilization past mercies present comforts and future prospects food with the appetite to eat it and the power to digest it raiment to wear books to read the church the salvation army the open bible the revelation of jesus christ the fountain opened for sin and uncleanness the glorious possibility of escape from the penalty and the power the consequences and the character of sin home and friends and heaven bending over all with god's sweet invitation come truly we have much to thank god for but if we would be thankful we must set our hearts to do it with a will we grumble and complain without thought but we must think to give thanks to murmur and repine is natural to give thanks to really give thanks is supernatural is gracious is a spirit not earth-born but comes down from god out of heaven and yet like all things from god it can be cultivated david said i will praise thee he put his will into it daniel prayed and gave thanks three times a day david outdid daniel for he says seven times a day do i praise thee know this that if you are not thankful your heart is yet bad your soul unclean for good hearts and pure souls are thankful so go to the root of the matter and get rid of sin and get filled with the holy spirit flee to jesus for riddance from the unholy spirit and the subtle selfishness that possesses you people who live in the midst of foul odours and harsh sounds cease to smell and hear them but if for a while they could slip away to the sweet air and holy quiet of the woods and fields and then return to their noxious and noisy homes their quickened senses would be shocked by their noisome surroundings 
and so selfish people often live in themselves so long that they do not realize their selfishness and sin except as light from heaven falls upon them but when god's sweet breath blows over them and his light shines into them then they are amazed at themselves when some humble saint full of faith and joy and the holy ghost crosses their path if they will but look they may see themselves as in a glass but especially is this so when we look at jesus and if we continue the look will transform us it is of this that the apostle speaks when he says we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the spirit of the lord and when this change has taken place the joy of jesus will be poured into the heart and praise will well up and bubble forth in thanksgiving as an unfailing fountain of sweet waters filling it with joy and earth your little corner of earth with peace and gladdening all who see and hear but if that change has not fully taken place in you do not withhold the praise that is god's due but think of his loving kindness and tender and multiplied mercies and begin to thank him now and your very giving of thanks will help to hasten the change begin now praise the lord Quote, holiness is indispensable to your completest usefulness my comrades you know the way of life and the blessedness of religion you can tell something of the love of god and the joys of the redeemed you can pray and sing and lead out to battle the armies of the king what else is wanted to complete your qualifications for doing the greatest possible amount of good but that you shall be able to say to your people that which i publish as attainable of personal peace and joy in communion with god i enjoy myself i am saved saved inside and out saved to the uttermost saved now and saved every day moreover my brethren there is something above and beyond the mighty influence which flows from and must ever accompany such a testimony as that i have named and that is the mighty power that accompanies the life itself a sanctified life means a gentle tender spirit it means a fearless undaunted zeal it means the accompanying manifestation of the holy ghost it is the prelude and condition and assurance of the endowment of power General William Booth in Salvation Soldiery. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle Don't Flinch The other evening I asked a captain for the story of her conversion. She told me that a few lines in a little book showed her the way to Jesus. She saw through these lines that if she would ask God to save her and would not flinch in her faith, he would do it. So she prayed and then waited for Jesus to come. She was very dark. She lived in a country that was full of spiritual darkness, and there was no one to teach her, and in her ignorance she thought Jesus would come in bodily presence. So she put her room in order, and earnestly waited and watched for him to open the door and come in. But he did not come. Then she remembered that God had promised to answer the prayers of two or three. So she wrote a note to a minister to come and pray with her. But something seemed to whisper to her, that this was doubting God, that she was trusting the minister's prayer and not the Lord, and this was doubt. So she tore up the note, and looking to God without flinching, she trusted, when suddenly Jesus came, not in bodily presence, but in spirit, and her whole soul was flooded with light and love and the glory of God. Bless the Lord for ever. Now I fully believe that it is just at this point that many souls draw back and fail. They flinch at the final test of faith. Just when all is on the altar, there is not one thing more to do but to stand still and see God come. An evil heart of unbelief draws back, or Satan comes suggesting something more to do, and the soul, dropping its eyes from the bending heavens, gets into the endless treadmill of endeavor to either help itself or to get somebody to help it, and so misses the prize and never finds God or rather never gives God a chance to show forth his saving power, 
and make his presence known while faith stands waiting and trembling taunted by mocking devils and all manner of suggestions to doubt it is hard not to flinch but flinching will prove as fatal to the revelation of jesus to your souls as a movement will prove to your picture when before the photographer's camera be still in your heart and trust look and wait and jesus will surely come there may be ceaseless outward activity but this inward soul quiet a watchfulness and faith are absolutely necessary to the revelation of the lord abraham slew his birds and beasts and laid them on the altar and waited expectantly for god to come and god came solomon built his temple placed everything in order then prayed and waited when lo the glory of god filled the temple till the priest could not stand in his presence elijah slew his bullock placed it on the altar poured water over it as a final work of faith then prayed and waited till the heavens opened and the fire fell and consumed his sacrifice the disciples prayed and waited on god for ten days then suddenly the holy ghost fell on them in tongues of fire that filled the world with light if these men had flinched when the time came to steadfastly look to god and believe the world would never have heard of them a ministerial friend of mine lost the blessing of full salvation i found him in this state and dealt faithfully with him he went to his church that night and told his people his condition and called them around the altar with him but he failed to get the blessing a wise friend of mine who happened to be present explained his failure by saying he didn't stay on his knees long enough he was in too big a hurry he didn't give god time to deal with him the fact was he flinched when the time to steadily watch and wait and trust came the lord god declared by the mouth of isaiah he that believeth shall not make haste isaiah twenty eight sixteen it is in this attitude of unflinching watching and waiting that faith and patience are made perfect and when this perfection is attained the lord will come suddenly to his temple even to the heart that has waited for him myriads are the souls that can say with the royal psalmist i waited patiently for the lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry he brought me up also out of an horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings and he hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our god psalm forty one to three how must we try the spirits answer one every spirit that leads you to trust in jesus fully and only looks upon him as all-sufficient to save and to keep forever is of god every spirit that leads you to joyfully confess and follow him as your lord and savior even though it be in the face of the whole world and unto death is of god every spirit that feels with more love to god and man is of god two pray to god for the holy spirit who can reveal to you every unholy spirit it is one of the offices of the holy ghost to guide us into all truth the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you john fourteen twenty six when he the spirit of truth has come he shall guide you into all truth john sixteen thirteen three go to the bible and seek for truth there and when they shall say unto you seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and mutter should not a people seek unto their god should the living seek unto the dead to the law and to the testimony that is to the bible if they speak not according to their word it is not because there is no light in them isaiah eight nineteen twenty. Four. quench not the spirit prove all things hold fast to that which is good abstain from every appearance of evil first thessalonians five sixteen and twenty three five wait upon god six don't get in a hurry and don't do a doubtful thing end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of heart talks on holiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brengel. Faith is what you want. 
Once, in one of our holiness meetings, I met a sister who was evidently in great spiritual distress, with intense hunger for full salvation. After a few moments' conversation, I felt assured that she was ready to accept the blessing, and so we knelt in prayer. But for some reason our prayers did not prevail. I then asked her if she were sure her consecration was complete. She at once declared it was. She was willing to die for it. Then, said I, Sister, there are three things you must believe. First, do you believe God is able to sanctify you wholly? Yes. Second, do you believe He is willing? Yes. Then, with your perfect consecration, there is but one other step to take, and the wonder work of grace will be done. Will you believe that he doeth it? For the promise is, Whatsoever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive, are receiving, and ye shall have. Will you believe this? But I don't feel that he does. That makes no difference, sister. Your faith must precede all feeling. But I can't believe that he has done it. I don't ask you to believe that he has done it, but that he is doing it in answer to your present faith. You must believe that he doeth it. If ever you get the witness of the Spirit, say, I will believe God. Well, I will try. No, that won't do. You must believe, not try to believe. Well, I am determined to struggle on until the blessing comes. No, sister, your struggles will do no good unless you believe, and, until you do this, you are making God a liar. But won't I be lying to say I will believe when I don't feel like it? No, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God to you is, Now are ye clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Ask, and ye shall receive. That evening I saw the sister again. She said, I have committed myself to God, and shall trust him, till the witness of my acceptance comes. The next day she was in the meeting, and related her experience, telling us that in the night God awoke her with an assurance of his love, and gave her the clear witness of the Spirit, that she was entirely sanctified, putting glory in her heart, and alleluias on her tongue. Entire consecration is not entire sanctification. You are commanded to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. This is entire consecration, but it is also said, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So then, there must be entire consecration, unwavering faith, and a frank, artless confession of both to Jesus. This is man's part, and, when these simple conditions are met and steadfastly maintained against all contrary feelings, God will suddenly come into his holy temple, filling the soul with his presence, purity, and power. This twofold work by man and God constitutes the one experience of entire sanctification. When this experience is yours, at your very earliest opportunity, confess it before men. End of chapter 21